What's up guys, I'm Jeff Montgomery and welcome to another episode of Tax Planning on the Whiteboard. This is part two of our series, Tax Planning in the Event of the Death of a Spouse. If you didn't catch part one, stop the video right now, go back, watch part one. That will give you a good background for our topic today. And again, if you like what you hear, please don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Okay, guys, in part one, we talked about the widow's penalty and we also talked about the step up in basis. Today, in this part, we are going to talk about tax planning involving the death of a spouse and the surviving spouse inherits the traditional IRA. Quick disclaimer, this is not advice specific to you. This is general information and education only, so please don't run out, do any strategies, implement any strategies that you might hear or see on this video today without first talking to your financial professional. So let's get into it, let's go to the whiteboard. Okay, on our whiteboard topic today, we're talking about when a surviving spouse inherits a traditional IRA from a deceased spouse. So a traditional IRA is what we're talking about. And with a traditional IRA, we always have to talk about options and tax implications for a surviving spouse and when do they have to take distributions. So we're gonna make a couple assumptions. So our first assumption is that we have a surviving spouse that is the sole beneficiary and we're gonna say sole primary beneficiary, okay? 100% would go to the surviving spouse. We're also going to say that there is one single contingent beneficiary. So there's an additional contingent beneficiary listed on the account. Typically, it's one of the children or if there's one, one child, 100%, maybe it's split up uh, amongst the children into different percentages. But let's just assume for our examples today, we have a primary beneficiary, the surviving spouse, and we have a contingent beneficiary, uh, just one at 100%, and let's just say it's one of their children, okay? Now, what are some options here for this surviving spouse? Well, the most, I would say the most popular, I don't have any data or stats on this except my own personal experience working with folks, is number one, the surviving spouse can treat the deceased IRA as their own. So we're gonna say surviving spouse treats the IRA as their own. Now, that is a very popular strategy. Um, we talk about that in two different ways. Number one, they could just uh, leave it at the existing uh, custodian. So let's say the uh, decedent had a traditional IRA at Fidelity, um, you know, deceased, the surviving spouse inherits the IRA, they treat it as their own, they could just leave it at Fidelity. And in a sense, we're talking really about just retitling it into their name. Now, the other option is they could move that deceased IRA to their own IRA at a different custodian. This is commonly called rollover, okay? And one thing we'll talk about with rollovers is we wanna talk about trustee to trustee transfers. So we could roll it, roll it over to a new custodian and we can really consolidate, this is almost like a consolidation play, we can consolidate into uh, one IRA at a new custodian, roll it over to the existing custodian. One thing that is important, we always recommend, please pay attention to this, always recommend a trustee to trustee transfer. That's super, super important because nowadays with the mail, we never know uh, when things arrive. Um, if we 
try to do the traditional 60-day rollover, which you can do one 60-day rollover technically in a 365-day period, not a calendar year, a 365-day year. You can only do one per year where you accept the money and then you have 60 days to roll it over into uh, your IRA account. We don't really recommend that. There are unlimited trustee to trustee transfers uh, or we call those direct rollovers or direct transfers. That's how we recommend do it. So pay attention uh, to that. Um, so that's a, that's a great option. What is another option? And we'll get into some examples on what makes sense and, and what, which option to do. But option number two is they could actually treat the inherited IRA, the deceased IRA, let's use that term, they could treat it as a inherited IRA, which also is commonly called, some custodians will call it, a beneficiary IRA. Okay, now this is confusing to some folks. They say, wait a second, Jeff. I am inheriting my spouse's IRA, so it is an inherited IRA. Remember the distinction here, and it's an important distinction. In the first option, they treated the IRA as their own. They even had the option to roll over those funds into their own IRA at a different custodian, so they could consolidate. This is very different because they're treating the IRA as an inherited IRA, or a beneficiary IRA, and it's actually being titled very differently than that. So that's the important point there. Now, what are some deciding factors on which option to, tr to choose? Do you treat it as your own or do you uh, treat it as an inherited IRA? So what are some of the deciding factors? I think the number one deciding factor is the age of both spouses. All right, so it's important to understand um, if the uh, deceased spouse was older, how much older. It's also important to understand if the surviving spouse is over age 59 and a half or under age 59 and a half, and we'll get into a couple examples here. And then number two is, does the surviving spouse need the money? Do they need the funds to live on? Okay, you know, for normal expenses. Is that a need or can they postpone distributions from that tr uh, traditional IRA? So let's give you an example. On our whiteboard here, what we're going to do is we're going to say the first example is the deceased spouse is age 70. Okay, the surviving spouse is age 60. And this example, remember, they could treat, the surviving spouse could treat it as their own or they could treat it as an inherited IRA. Well, I chose age 60 for a reason because that is obviously older than 59 and a half. So if the surviving spouse treats the IRA as their own, they will have, they will follow their own required minimum distribution rules, right? It's now their IRA. So required minimum distributions, as we know, post Secure Act, start at age 72. So the year you turn 72 is when your first minimum distribution is due. They actually give you a little grace period until April 1st of the year after you turn 72. Be careful on that side note, you have to take two out that following year. So normally, people will start their first minimum distribution at age 72. So in this example, that is an additional 12 years of deferral, of tax deferral. So this IRA account, treating it as the own for the surviving spouse, can grow for an additional 12 years before distributions are required. However, it is accessible, guys, you can access this money. You're over 59 and a half. You can take the money out. It is accessible. You can use it at any time period before age 72. Uh, just keep in mind that most likely it's going to be taxable, but you avoid the 10% penalty, okay? Now, in our second example here, let's use the deceased spouse, and let's just say, I don't know, age 68, okay? Okay. 
and we'll say the surviving spouse is age, let's go 55. So under 59 and a half. Now remember, if you're under 59 and a half and you're treating the IRA as your own IRA, okay, what happens when you take money out prior to age 59 and a half with very few exceptions? Well, you would have taxes and a 10% penalty. Taxes plus a 10% penalty. So in this situation, in this example, this surviving spouse who is under 59 and a half, he or she may choose to say, you know what, I'm going to treat this as an inherited IRA. I'm not going to treat it as my own. Now, what that does is some interesting things. It gives that surviving spouse access that, to that money prior to age 59 and a half without the 10% penalty. It is still taxable. So please keep in mind that these are IRA funds. They've never been taxed. But if you are under 59 and a half and you treat that IRA as an inherited IRA, you can avoid that 10% penalty if you need the funds to live on. So that's one of the questions. Do you need the money and what is your current age? The other thing it gives you the ability to not touch the money. You don't have to take any required minimum distributions until, if you're treating it as an inherited IRA, until your spouse, deceased spouse, would have been 72, okay? Age 72. So, in this example, we have a deceased spouse that's 68, surviving spouse that's 55. Uh, in this example, the surviving spouse could delay taking any money out of this account until their deceased spouse would have been age 72, which in this example would have been four years of deferral, at which point then the surviving spouse would have to start taking required minimum distributions based on the single life table, her life expectancy. Now, what's really interesting about this, at any time in the future, if it's treated as an inherited IRA, that surviving spouse could later on do a rollover, okay, into their own IRA. So later on, they could do a rollover, again, direct transfer into their own IRA and treat it as their own. So they could start out as an inherited IRA and then later on change their mind, maybe post 59 and a half and treat it as a, uh, treat it as their own IRA. Really interesting strategies there. One last strategy is, um, and remember I mentioned a contingent beneficiary under the assumptions here. Well, with a contingent beneficiary named on the beneficiary form, a surviving spouse could disclaim any or all of the IRA account to the designated contingent beneficiary on the form. Now, this is an interesting strategy post Secure Act. Now, post Secure Act, if you were to leave money to a designated beneficiary that is not an eligible designated beneficiary. So really, we're mainly talking about your children, your child. And that child would have a 10-year rule. They have to withdraw that money within 10 years. Pre-Secure Act, they could have stretched that out among their life expectancy. So you could imagine a 40 or 50-year-old inheriting an IRA could stretch that out for a good maybe 35 or 40 years. Uh, now it has to be compressed. It has to come out within a 10-year time period. So in this example, let's just say we have a really large IRA. Let's say it's a $2 million IRA. I know, probably pretty rare, but let's just use this example. And let's say the surviving spouse does not need all $2 million to live on. Okay, so let's say the surviving spouse only needs... I don't know, let's say 1 million, only needs 1 million of the 2 million uh, to last her lifetime, all right? So she could disclaim, 
one million to the named contingent beneficiary, and that would be, let's just say, her child, okay? That child, son or daughter, doesn't matter, of course, would have a 10-year withdrawal schedule on that $1 million, 10-year withdrawal, okay, on the $1 million. Now, let's say, fast forward, 10 years later, uh, the surviving spouse then passes away, and remember, she kept $1 million. She disclaimed another million, and now the surviving spouse will send that additional million, named the beneficiary because she treated it as her own, and then that other one million, leaving it to the child, that child will get an additional 10-year withdrawal schedule on that one million. So and essentially, rather than leaving all two million to a child right away and having it had to come out in 10 years, this disclaiming is almost like an estate planning strategy where surviving spouse disclaims part of the IRA, uh, retains part of the IRA, and therefore can do two different uh, distributions as a designated beneficiary to the child, and that child would have two 10-year periods to withdraw that money. I hope that makes sense. We can get into much more detail later on on those uh, strategies. So look, the big takeaway here is um, understand all your options if you are a surviving spouse inheriting your deceased spouse traditional IRA. Meet with your financial professional. Your circumstance is very unique. Again, this is general information only. Um, so take that uh, as it is. Meet with your financial professional and understand your options. This has been Jeff Montgomery with Tax Planning on the Whiteboard, and we'll see you next time.